Hello everybody, and welcome back to another Let's Talk About video. This is going to be a much shorter one than the other ones, but, you know, still a video. I'm getting close to my week limit, I need to actually upload a video before this week is out, because I was kind of predisposed the last couple of days. But anyways, here I am. And today I'm talking about nuclear saltwater rockets. Uh, in the background, I have Kerbal Space Program playing with my interpretation of one. It, well, it's more of just for show, because the, uh... The, the, the performance of, of a nuclear saltwater rocket, I couldn't actually replicate with a normal engine. So I put on the infinite fuel hack, just or the cheat, just so I could simulate the uh, performance that way. But anyway, that's going to be running in the background. It's a transfer stage and, and an orbiter, and I'm sending it out to EVE, just because it's the closest. But anyways, what is a nuclear saltwater rocket? Uh, well, it's exactly what you'd think it is, actually. It's a nuclear engine that runs on salt water, but not conventional salt water, not sodium chloride, not ocean water. I'm talking nuclear salt water. So it's actually a solution of water mixed with 20%, um, what is it, uranium tetrabromide? Yeah. And it's basically mixed together and held in a, or held in a bunch of cylinders, like a bunch of tubes of beryllium carbide. And it has to be stored this way. You can't store it in one big tank because, again, it's highly enriched uranium. And if you had it all in one big tank, it would well, undergo fission, and you don't want that happening inside your spacecraft. So you store it in these uh, beryllium carbide tubes, which act as neutron absorbers and um, basically tempers. And it keeps the neutron flux down so the uranium doesn't go critical while it's inside the ship. And once you want to go somewhere, you just pump the uh, the salt water out of the engine and into the engine chamber, which is, in the original design, it was like a little chamber with a bell on it. I don't think that's a good idea because the material science wouldn't really allow for that because, again, it is a literally a nuclear explosion because what happens is the once the salt water exits the uh, beryllium carbide tubes it you know the uranium undergoes fission because of the uran of the uh, neutron flux that goes on within the uh, salt water and it flash vaporizes the water and the water acts as reaction mass and presto you ha you have propulsion now this is really really cool because it allows you to have high specific impulse and high thrust and with rocket engines, it's usually a trade-off between the two. Chemical engines give, give you high thrust, low specific impulse. Ion engines give you high specific impulse, low thrust. A nuclear saltwater rocket gives you both high specific impulse and high thrust. So you can actually burn the engine for a very long time and ob obtain very, very ungodly speeds. And... Uh, it's just it's really, really cool, actually. So I keep looking at the video and losing my track of thought, my, my train of thought. It's very late. But yeah, um, what I have going on here is I'm just trying to line up the orbit with Eve, which it doesn't actually work. It kind of, I, I have it built wrong and it drifts and it screws itself up. But the whole point of this video is to show that you can get um, really high speeds and you can actually, instead of having to do Hoffman transfers, uh, you can do brachistochrome uh, transfer or trajectories. I butchered that word. Brachistochrome trajectories? Yeah. Where basically it's point A to point B. I'm pretty sure Scott Manley did a video just like this talking about them, where he sent a probe to Eve using a torch ship kind of situation like this. But he was talking about it in uh, the relation to the Expanse. It's a far better video. I recommend you go find it and watch it. But in my video, I'm just going to ramble on. So, yeah. In, uh, in this case, I can get from Kerbin to Eve in about a day, uh, one Kerbin day. And as you'll see here, as I get, you know, faster and faster, the um, how long it takes, you know, goes down. And the whole point of this is you can basically keep the engine running non-stop. So you have it burning all the way until you get halfway, and you turn it around and you decelerate, so you burn it the other way. And one other thing that this gives you, which is really, really cool, is if you can accelerate at 1g continuously, you get artificial you get artificial gravity out of it, linear artificial gravity, because as you're accelerating, everything is pushed to the back at 1g. So if you're a person in there, you can just walk around normal. And then when you're decelerating at 1g, same thing, you're being pushed to the front, so you can just walk around. And this is actually really cool, because linear artificial gravity 
it would feel far more natural than, say, centrifugal artificial gravity, so like a spinning habitat. So if you're in a, a, a ship like this, you would have gravity that felt pretty normal, which is pretty cool. Unlike with rotating habitat, every time you'd move your head, you'd probably feel it because of uh, the Coriolis effect, and you might get nauseous, I don't know. I probably would. <coughs> Sorry, my throat's a little sore. And uh, this class of ship is actually called a torch ship, which was a term um, coined by Robert Heinlein. He wrote Starship Troopers, good book, I recommend it. And just the whole rationale behind it is you can fast travel anywhere with it. Like, I'm talking in real life, a torch ship like this could get you to Saturn in two weeks. You can get to Mars in, a, like, a few days. You can get to Pluto in under a month. It's, like, it's it's really, really cool. I don't, I don't know the exact time. I know Saturn's, like, two weeks for a nuclear saltwater rocket, if you did it right. Uh, but I forget what the other ones are. Basically, the further away it is, there isn't much drop-off in terms of distance to speed. Because since you're accelerating the entire time, you're still going to get there pretty damn fast. I think I remember, again, from a Scott Manley video, uh, talking about In the Expanse, and how they got from, it was like, Saturn to, uh, to the asteroid belt. Cirrus? Or Vesta? Anyways, and it took them like 14 days, or something. Oh, I should have, I should go back and rewatch that video. But either way, um... A, a torch drive would basically open, open up the solar system to everybody because you can get anywhere in the blink of an eye. You could go to the moon on a day trip. Like, literally, it'd be great. One problem with nuclear saltwater engines, as you can imagine, is it's literally a nuclear explosion all the time. So, if you have the fuel reacting inside of a an engine, like a normal rocket, it would probably melt the engine or explode. But I, I, have, I have a thought that you can make it work kind of like an Orion drive where you pump it out the back and make sure that it doesn't react inside the ship, but reacts outside of it, just, you know, in a, uh, a large half-hemisphere half kind of bell. Uh, it wouldn't be as efficient as an internal engine, but it would probably be easier to manage without the melting. And you need a lot of, like, really big radiators, because it would produce a lot of thermal energy, like a lot of heat. Which is why I, here I have a bunch of them. I actually, I made a model, a 3D model, a little while ago, of my idea of a uh, nuclear saltwater transfer stage with an orbiter for the outer planets. Because again, I love Saturn, I think Uranus and Neptune need more uh, exploration, but they're a real pain in the ass to get out to. So if we were to like build small-scale nuclear saltwater rockets, we could send probes to fast travel pretty much anywhere. Uh, using them for crewed spacecraft? It's a little questionable because again they are quite dangerous and they produce a lot of radiation and they expel a lot of radiation and they can explode basically with the force of a nuclear weapon so maybe not for crewed vehicles maybe it depends on how how how, how you could safety rate them but for robotic missions uh the only real danger is trying to transport the nuclear fuel into space because if the rocket explodes well yeah that would be that would be problematic, but yeah, it would just be a um, a really cool idea. And I personally love the idea of the nuclear saltwater rocket. I think it's a really really cool idea. I kind of too bad it was designed by Robert Zubrin, but that's a gripe I'm not going to talk about here. <laughs> it's kind of like the Orion Drive in that it had you know it could open up the solar it could open up the solar system, but unlike the Orion Drive, it's not really illegal because you're not actually detonating bombs or building bombs, you're just using enriched material. Uh, they can use plutonium, not just uranium, but uh, the uranium one is the one that I know the most of, which is uh, uranium tetrabromide solution. So, yeah, nuclear saltwater rockets. I think they're fascinating. I think we should build them in a small scale just to try them out. Why not? Like, there are other engine ideas we could use for uh, crewed vehicles that would also give us pretty good performance. Not as much, but still good performance. Like the nuclear light bulb idea, where you have an engine that uses um, the, like, the fuel, like the uranium fuel is in a gaseous form. I think something like uranium uh, hexafluoride, but maybe not. But I don't know the exact gas, but I know that you can make uh, gaseous uranium, like uranium hexafluoride, which is what they use to actually... Um, 
enrich it, but that's another topic. Anyways, and the point is, you run this uh, this nuclear gas through closed containers that are um, transparent to UV light. So, I think the designs had like a quartz material, and what you do is you basically dump uh, hydrogen fuel or any kind of like hydrogen fuel, yeah, as the working fluid, through the core, and it's superheated by the UV radiation coming out of it, and expelled at the back. So basically it's a thermal nuclear rocket, but there's no actual contact between the fuel and the working fluid. And theoretically, because there's no contact, you can actually, and because there's no physicality in the actual engine core, it's just a gas, it could operate at much higher temperatures, but there's still the physical limits of the uh, container that actually contains the um, the fuel and another problem with that is you have to have a material that's as transparent to UV light as possible so you could make make like a um, a graphene or graphite and permeated uh, quartz which would have higher thermal loads but it wouldn't be as transparent and that's a problem so yeah anyways that was a bit of a tangent but it's a good one so Thank you all for watching. I hope you enjoyed. I'll be back with more videos later. I have another video I need to make where I talk about mitochondria, but I keep forgetting to do that video, so I'll get to it eventually. But thank you all for watching. I hope you enjoyed, and space.